Welcome to a Brookwood Baptist Health exclusive. My name is Brian Pavlik, and I have with me interventional cardiologist, Dr. Matthew Sample with Brookwood Baptist Health. Dr. Sample, what's going on today, man? Hi, how are you? Thanks for I'm having doing, me. Doing well, man. It's funny because in the health industry, we have all of these awareness months and awareness days. And I got an email from you saying, hey, Brian, I know it's on your calendar. Heart Valve Disease Awareness Day, February 22nd. And I didn't see the card at Hallmark, but, you know, I, I kind of got excited about it. And, uh, you know, it's funny. It may be one of those obscure heart awareness days, not like, you know, some other ones that may be out there. But it's very important, especially to people in your world. I mean, there's a few stats out there that I don't know if people know. And, and we're getting these from like heart.org and, you know, these American Heart Association. 11.6 million Americans are estimated to have heart valve disease. And then they say each year around 25,000 people die from the disease. And we're gonna go one more further. Three out of four people know nothing about heart valve disease. So here you are today, you're going to educate us. Even though so many people suffer from it and so many people don't know about it, educate us today, Dr. Sample, what exactly at the simplest level is heart valve disease? Sure. The heart has the responsibility for pumping blood in a single direction uh, to the body. Uh, it has to go in, in one direction, and that's accomplished through one-way valves. The heart has four of the valves. Uh, it has two on the left side of the heart, which pump blood to the body. It has two on the right side of the heart, which pumps blood to the lungs. The most common valves that become dysfunctional in our lifetimes usually are on the left side, the aortic valve, most common, and then the mitral valve. So I've always been told to relate heart issues to, to like a car engine. And if you overuse your heart, just like you, if you overuse your car engine, something may happen or something may go wrong. And then of course the opposite, if you don't use your heart or if you don't use your car engine enough, it may not start, it may not work properly or whatever. So I say all that analogy wise, who are more at risk to get heart valve disease? Is it somebody who overuses their heart or maybe even an older demographic or maybe somebody who doesn't use their heart enough, meaning like an inactive person? Do you see more common cases in a certain demographic based on how much they do or how little they do? So, you know, not in terms of overuse. Um, the origin of heart valve disease is kind of an interesting process that mm -hmm. when you look back into the uh, pre-antibiotic era, the most common reason for heart valve disease was infection, specifically rheumatic fever. Uh, and this caused rheumatic mitral stenosis, which is a narrowing of the mitral valve, uh, rheumatic aortic stenosis, which is a narrowing of the aortic valve. Uh, but then in the 1940s, when antibiotics came out, uh, we basically saw no more rheumatic fever in um, urban areas after the 1960s. Uh, now, what we see is mainly age-related uh, valvular heart disease. So as we age and as our hearts beat, we have about 100,000 heartbeats per day, uh, we end up with wear and tear on the valves. That can lead to calcifications, that can cause a narrowing or even a leak. And so you're more likely to develop um, degenerative valvular heart disease the longer you live. And it becomes extremely common after the age of 75. So there you go. So we're talking a little bit older demographic, just a little bit on the age range there and uh, things. So. Uh, talking with Dr. Matthew Sample, interventional cardiologist with Brookwood Baptist Health. We're talking about heart valve disease. And, you know, it's funny, Dr. Sample, this isn't one of those things. It's an internal thing. So it's not like you can just look at it and say, oh, something looks wrong. And of course, you know, unfortunately, we've come to a time in society where the general pop population is going to joke around and say, oh, if you're sick, it's probably COVID. So what are these symptoms that someone may look out for or experience that kind of indicates, hey, you know what, this might be something different. It may actually be heart valve disease. What are those symptoms we can kind of monitor? So I think, you know, for the most part, valvular heart disease, it, certainly in the beginning stages can be very subtle in terms of symptoms, but some of the more pronounced severe symptoms would be extreme shortness of breath or breathlessness, uh, fatigue, uh, decreased energy, uh, chest pressure, tightness with physical exertion, uh, in very severe cases, uh, actually passing out. Um, but for the most part, valvular heart disease symptoms tend to be insidious. Uh, most patients just think that I'm getting older. Right. Uh, and that's a common thing that I hear uh, in the office is, 
well, you know, I'm getting older. I think I'm supposed to be slowing down. Uh, there really isn't an age that you're supposed to be slowing down. And so if you're not doing the things, and this is the way I usually phrase this. I like it when patients are, who have spouses are able to come with those spouses because you get another person's perspective. And so what I usually will ask the spouse is, what is he or she not doing today that they were doing two years ago? Interesting. And, and a lot of the times I'll hear, well, you know, he used to go out, oh, two or three times a week and play golf. You know, I haven't seen him do that in a while. And patients over time tailor their output to what their heart valves will allow them to do. Right. Uh, and so oftentimes that results in us not getting to valvular heart disease until very late uh, in the disease process. You know, it's funny. So here I am, I'm a 38 year old kid. Let's call it what it is, right? I take my lisinopril, I got my multivitamin, I take the fish oil, you know, here I am already starting to get my pills per day and stuff like that. I try to run, you know, try to, I think I'm relatively active, but are there any preventative measures? And that was a great insight that you just gave about like, where were you like two years ago? That's almost a cool benchmark to think about and say, okay, two years ago, man, I was running this much or I was playing this type of activity. Um, but are there any preventive measures like starting today where if I think I have this, that maybe you recommend to reduce the risk? Is there anything? Well, I always recommend uh, physical activity. Uh, I'm a big proponent of this, um, you know, the American Heart Association recommends 150 minutes per week of physical activity. And, and I phrase that to my patients as, think of that as a dose of medicine that you have to take. You have to get 150 minutes cool. of physical activity in per week. And it doesn't matter when you get it. You can be a weekend warrior, do all 150 minutes on Saturday and Sunday, or you can break it up into 30 minute uh, slots throughout the week. Um, but that's good for overall cardiovascular health. It's also, as it turns out, good for mental health. It's good for bone health. It's good for endocrine health. Um, unfortunately, it won't really prevent valvular heart disease. Uh, the opposite side of the coin is that you really can't induce valvular heart disease by overuse. And so if you have valvular heart disease, you shouldn't fear necessarily going out and exerting yourself. Always listen to your body. If it's telling you you need to take a break, then, then do that. Uh, but you're not going to be able to either worsen or improve your valvular heart disease with um, lifestyle modifications, unfortunately. I got that. And in fact, one of the marketing campaigns for Brookwood Baptist Health this year is listen to your heart. As Dr. Sample just said, listen to your body, listen to your heart. And so Dr. Sample, the final question I have here, you know, we're not scaring anybody into anything. We're just giving education. But if you're one of those people who is watching this right now and you say, you know what, I've been experiencing this or something's been off with my body for the past couple of months, year or so, what are the steps that I need to do? Dr. Sample, what do you recommend a patient who may see this or who you educate, is it time to go to your primary care doctor first and they work with you? What, what do you, what's kind of that first step that they need to take to say, okay, let's, let's see if everything's working properly. And so it's not heart valve disease. Where do you recommend yeah. they go first? Well, I always say, listen to your body. You know your body better than anyone. And if you think something's going wrong, you probably do need to get it checked out. Um, primary care doctors are worth their weight in gold in terms of being able to differentiate what might be causing a symptom. Uh, they're good at knowing if they need a, a referral to a specialist, what type it needs to, to be. Um, so usually these are best handled through your primary care doctor, mm -hmm. unless you already have a cardiologist. Uh, newer worsening symptoms that we talked about earlier, you could just go directly to them. Oh, perfect. Dr. Sample, you've been great, man. You've been a close colleague behind the scenes as far as, uh, you know, just helping out with some education on my part for some marketing that's going out there, um, but also just being a great advocate for Brookwood Baptist Health, our cardiology programs. Meet wonderful physicians like Dr. Sample uh, throughout all of our network, including cardiology, orthopedics, primary care, as you mentioned. We've got so many different specialties in central Alabama, and this is just one shining example of why uh, Brookwood Baptist Health is just one of the best out there. And as he said, and as we will repeat, your health can't wait. Listen to your body, especially listen to your heart. Get in, make an appointment with whether a primary care physician today, a cardiologist, if you have one. And of course, we'd love to see you. So Dr. Sample, I appreciate your time, my friend. We'll look, look forward to the next talk we have, man. Thank you. All right. For everybody else, thank you for watching. Have a great day.